Hey everyone! In the previous video, I cliffhangered you with the question of what happens when the test requirements are not met for a chi-square test of independence. Well, that's going to be the topic for today. These testing requirements allow us to utilize these particular distributions, such as chi-square, or the t, or the z distribution, uh, such that we can accurately determine probabilities that correspond to the test statistics for that test. And well, if that requirement is not met, here this is the requirement that all expected values need to exceed 5. If that is not met, then we have this other test called Fisher's exact test. In almost all the other previous hypothesis tests that we've done, I've always shown you the very precise formulas that go into those hypothesis tests. This is going to be the exception, however, because Fisher's exact test, while we are totally capable of calculating the components that go into it, it is quite cumbersome. And so I want to instill the reasons why we use it, and we'll just use R to, to actually perform the test. Um, but I want to make sure we know when to use this test. So Fisher's exact test is particularly for a, a test for independence. And Typically, we'd want to use the chi-square test there, but if this requirement is not met, Fisher's exact. Let's jump into an example. You know how I like to do. Here I've got some sample data. Is catching the flu independent of getting the flu shot? Okay, that sounds like a perfect scenario here for a chi-square test for independence. That would be the test we would want to try to use. So let's define the null and alternative hypothesis here. The null hypothesis, remember, is always a statement of these two categorical variables being independent. So catching the flu is independent of getting the flu shot. For the alternative hypothesis, here I'm actually going to do a directional alternative hypothesis because the anticipation would be that if you got the shot, you would expect to be less likely to get the flu. So I'm going to keep this as a directional alternative hypothesis. However, I need to provide a caveat. The chi-square goodness of fit test and the chi-square test for independence only allow for non-directional alternative hypothesis. However, I know that we're not going to be able to do the chi-square test here reliably, so uh, I know we're going to use Fisher's exact test. However, Fisher's exact test does allow for directionality. Um, so I'm just, I have that in the back of my mind. <laughs> does allow directional alternative hypotheses. Okay. So this is a directional. Good. So this is the point in which I would usually run through the process of the test statistic p-value, but we're just going to go right into R. So I'm going to need to transcribe this data frame into R. Okay, I've got R open and I've started creating vectors. We're going to need three vectors if I want to create this entire complete data frame. The first vector, got flu, is actually only a text vector where I need 
entries for yes and no. Because they are text, I need to put them in quotations. No shot is a vector that contains the values 14, 13. I do not need to put those in quotations because that is a numeric vector. The shot vector, 2, 10. And now I need to create a data frame. I'll call it flu. It's been a while since we've made a data frame, but we did this in the beginning of the semester. I want to combine into a package our three vectors. Got flu, no shot, shot. Okay, let's, let's run these and make sure they're all operational. No errors, that's good. And I always like to visually take a look at our data and especially making a data frame, make sure everything is looking as it should. As mentioned at the beginning of this example, this is a prime time situation for the chi-square test of independence in which we would enter the data frame flu. As detailed in the previous video, R is going to get stuffed up with this first vector in the data frame because it's text, it's not numeric. So we use comma because I want both the rows. I don't want to exclude either of the two rows. So I'm going to leave that space empty here. But I only want the columns two through three. I don't want the first one. Okay, so this is prime time for a chi-square test of independence, but we're going to run into some problems. And let's see what that happens to be. I think we're going to need some more space here. Let's run our chi-square test. Going to see some problems. Okay, so as we did in the previous video, we would probably charge right over to the p-value and start making our conclusions. However, notice there is a warning message. The chi-squared approximation may be incorrect. That is a warning to you that the requirements for this test might not be satisfied. Remember, we need to now go look at the expected values, dollar sign expected, for this test. And because we got that warning, I bet you one of these expected values is going to fall short of the value 5. So here, because this is a 2 by 2 contingency table, there are four entries, so there are four expected values as shown here. And notice one of them, at least one of them, does not exceed 5. So therefore, we probably shouldn't use the chi-square test here. Okay, so that's the setup for the Fisher's exact test. What happens when we cannot meet this requirement? Let's do the new test. Here we go. The input for Fisher's exact test is the same. Maybe I can even copy paste. Except it's not Kaisk, it's Fisher. Now I'm adding another layer here. Recall we said that the chi-square test does not allow for directional alternative hypotheses. However, we do have a directional alternative hypothesis here. Because you actually can do that with Fisher's test. So we got to be careful with how this is defined. Catching the flu is less likely with the flu shot. Okay. Well, I guess we can see the table here. We need to consider how R is regarding 
our data frame. And here's how R considers it. R considers the first row and the first column to, in its determinations, determine the direction of the alternative hypothesis. So let's think about what's going on in the first row and the first column here. No shot, no flu shot, and however, getting the flu. Wouldn't we expect it to be more likely to get the flu without the shot? This question was phrased in the, the other way around. Catching the flu is less likely with the shot, but that is equivalent to saying it is more likely without the shot. And since that is the way that this data frame has been organized, just that's the way it came, that's the way we need to refer to this in R. So first row and first column, getting the flu, yes, is more likely without the shot. So our alternative hypothesis more likely is going to be greater. Okay, I think that is going to do it. Oh, but I need to put that text inside the parentheses there. There it goes. All right, uh, that's going to be the Fisher's exact test. Let's run it. Fisher's exact test. It computes the p-value exactly. For the time being, we can just go ahead and ignore some of these other outputs from Fisher's exact test, and let's just focus on that p-value to state our conclusion. I'm going to keep this p-value in mind and then write up our conclusion over here. Since the p-value for Fisher's exact test was 0 0.04098, which is less than our usual alpha level of significance of 0 0.05, we will reject the null hypothesis. So this provides sufficient evidence, just barely, um, this provides sufficient evidence that getting the flu is less likely when getting the flu shot, or at least that is what the data seems to suggest. This data provides evidence that getting the flu is less likely when getting the flu shot. I would like to follow up this conclusion with a couple questions. Could this be an error? Remember, this isn't an error in the sense of a typographical error, or I forgot to carry the one. This is an error about regarding the conclusion to the hypothesis test, and it eventually stems back to sampling error, where I mean, possibly we could have gotten a wonky sample that's not quite representative of the population, but we don't know. We do not know. All we see is the sample, not the population. However, if an error occurred, we have special names for those. Could it have been a type 1 or type 2? Do you remember? 
when we reject the null hypothesis, it's possible that a false positive could have occurred. I put those in air quotes. And that is what we call a type 1 error. Okay, that's going to wrap it up for Fisher's exact test.